Now here, what we have here is the Panzer I. This is um, a replica that was built in Spain by um, Jose Martinez. It took him five years to build it and it came over for Tank Fest. It's going back later this year and it's a meticulous recreation of a Panzer I. The main difference is it's got a 150 horsepower Mercedes-Benz engine and automatic transmission. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about here now is the actual development and design of this actual Panzer I. So this is an out B and what we're going to look at is the development of the tank starting off. So 1930, Krupp, the German armaments manufacturer, is approached to basically come up with a design that could be a scouting vehicle, could be a munitions weapons carrier, or could tow a, a basically an anti-tank gun, that type of thing. So they start work on something, they start work on a wooden model, and what they're looking at is to build a, a vehicle that could basically carry these, um, and develop these actual um, designs. And that's what they work on. It's not, they're not looking to build a tank at the beginning. 1931, they come up with a design which has the engine at the front and the drive at the rear. Again, still looking to have something that starts resembling a tank. At this time, it's called the light tractor. And so basically, they're coming up with these designations that mean you can't work out that it's a tank. And this is before the Nazis get into power. This is under the Weimar Republic. So the Weimar Republic are allowing these tanks to be built, these tracked vehicles, and this is what they're doing, they're working on this. So they start looking at it, and really they're focusing on the hull, the design of the hull and how this works. And they're looking to be build these, these vehicles, and what you get in 1933 is the development of the superstructure. So they start to look at basically putting the superstructure up, using, this, um, using welding techniques, Krupp had never welded 13 mil plate before. They always welded the big stuff, the, sh the ships, but never this small plate. So they had to learn how to do that. And basically they start work on a turret. And this is happening separately to what's happening with a hull. And the turret is basically developed at the beginning to take a two centimetre gun with a coaxial machine gun. The interesting thing is there is they don't think that they can get that turret ready in time to fit the tank. So they leave that to develop on its own. That's the turret and gun system that becomes the Panzer II. So they're looking to fit a twin, a twilling turret. This is with two machine guns in, and that's what they're trying to do. They looked at the First World War, and they realized that the Renault FT-17 was the light tank that they really wanted to copy. The idea is of, um, General Estienne's idea of the b swarm. You build so many of these light, cheap tanks that you swarm over the enemy and you overwhelm their anti-tank defence. It doesn't matter that you've got a few of your tanks knocked out, it means you actually break through with so many of them, there's too many to knock out. And so that's the idea they start developing on. And what they're looking to do, once the Nazis have come to power, from 1933 onwards, is to create these um, panzer divisions and equip them with these tanks. So they make an order for a thousand panzer ones. And this becomes the Panther One Alstad. And by mid-1935, they've got them starting to deliver to the actual Panther divisions. The Aus B, which is this one, Aus, uh, Aus for all means uh, Model B, this is the one that they start actually um, introducing uh, production changes to. And this starts coming out in July 1936. I'll start taking us through the actual um, design of it and actual features of the tank now. So, in terms of its armament, we have that turret, which has two Drazer MG13K machine guns. Now these are put in a fixed mount, so they're rigidly mounted. And basically, you have one on the left and one on the right that's um, adjustable. These are 7.92mm uh, machine guns, and they are equipped with magazines. Now they start out with 25 magazines, later on you'll get a 75 magazine but that's what you're equipped with. And you'd be given 61 of these magazines in the actual tank itself, in terms of storage. Now they're fixed in position, and what's gonna happen is, you're gonna have basically an elevating wheel and um, a traversing wheel. 
and that's where the triggers are for the gunner. So we have a gunner commander in the turret, and we have a driver below here. Now the gunner commander has got a little hole in front of him, in between the two machine guns, and that's where a 2.5 magnification sight is. Now we sighted out to 800 metres in 200 metre graduations, so he can fire these machine guns out to 800 metres. Now, they are given special armour-piercing ammunition, but that only has a range of about 150 metres. So realistically, you're looking at machine gun armed tanks that are capable of supporting infantry and attacking infantry targets. They don't have a gun at this time, and this is what we've got. So in terms of the actual armour itself, we have um, 8 mil at the front there, 13 mil pretty much all over the superstructure. We have a special bit here that's 14.5 mil. We have 8 mil on the top and 6 mil on the belly plate. Now, the thing that they did with the LSP was they wanted to improve it. So basically, Krupp had developed a, a 60 horsepower engine which was in the LSP, but that was an air-cooled engine. So what they looked at with the LSP was to come up with a water-cooled engine. And so what they did was they basically went to a number of different German manufacturers and Maybach was the one that came up with the 3038TR engine that could fit in there. And it fitted in exactly the same position, in exactly the same engine bay with the irradiator and all the other um, paraphernalia that went with the actual engine itself. And that fitted in there nicely. The difference was you were getting about 75% more performance. You went from 60 horsepower to 100 horsepower. And that's the reason they did it. To do this, they also extended the length of the side panels of the actual tank by 40 millimeters. The other thing you're gonna see with, between the Alps A and the Alps B is the fact that they added an additional wheel. So what we get here is on the, on the Alps B here, We've got a front wheel here, that's on an axle. We've then got twin wheels here and twin wheels here. This is where they add an additional wheel. So we go to basically five wheels here, plus the idler and plus the, uh, the, the drive sprocket at the front there. This idler as well, with the L stays, was much more on the ground. So they lift that up and basically that also becomes your track tensioner. So they changed pretty much the drive system of the tank with the LSP. They also introduced a fourth return roller. So if you're ever looking to identify an LSP and an LSP, that's the key bit. An LSP will have four road wheels with three return rollers, an LSP will have five with four return rollers. So that's the key bit you're looking at. In terms of performance, this has got basically about 40 kilometers an hour on the road. So about 22, 23 miles an hour, and about 15 miles an hour, 25 kilometers an hour on cross country. Okay, so it's moving around on there. It's got leaf spring suspension here, and this has been copied off of the Vickers Cardinoid tanks of the early mid 1930s. What we have here as well with this Spanish tank is we've got the markings for the Spanish Civil War. So the Spanish Civil War starts in 1936. Um, the Italians send tanks, the Russians, the Soviets send tanks, and they send T26s and some BT tanks, and the Germans send some tanks. They send 122 tanks in all. 21 of them will be the Aus B, Panzer I. Now, what they're going to do with these tanks is basically use them with the Spanish crews. So that's what they're going to do. And this one is marked as one of those. And so basically, it, it's, the Germans are led by a, an officer called Von Toma, and he has basically got two battalions. So if you see the markings on the tank, you'll see the Legion Escudo here, that's the marking in white with the gun and the, uh, and the sword. And then basically you've got the Spanish flag, and then on the, on the left there, on the right of the actual tank, you've got a circle. The circle is, denotes the second battalion. If it had a diamond, it would be the first battalion. 
We also have the number 413. This is the fourth company of the first section, and this is the third tank. So that denotes which what the tank is. And actually, the opening the, um, the hatch there, the commander's hatch to the front, on the top of that is basically a cross of St. Andrew, and on, so it's a black cross on a white background, and that's for air recognition. Okay, so this is what they would be going into. So the tanks would be operated in Spain, late 1936 into 1937, pretty much around the Madrid area at the beginning. And what they're going to be doing is training Spanish crews to operate them. So these are being used by nationalist forces. The Republicans are the ones in government. They're the ones being supplied by the Soviet forces. So the nationalist ones, these are Franco's um, troops. These are the ones who are going to be training, being trained by the Germans. The Germans really don't tend to operate them themselves. So they're training these Spanish crews how to operate and use the Panzer ones. And what happens is basically they don't have a lot of time training and they don't have a lot of time to actually uh, learn how to tactically employ them. So a lot of the fighting is basically fairly basic. So what you tend to have is the T26, that's armed with a 45mm gun, that tends to stand off and fire at these at long range. The Panzer ones have only got the capability of hitting them with armour piercing rounds at 150 metres. So what you get is the T26 stands there for about 1,000 metres popping off at these tanks with these tanks having to move around. They can't afford to stand still, otherwise they'd be overmatched. And what they tended to find was, from the, on the German side was, basically they were getting hit in the, um, at the turret ring, they were jamming the turret, and also the actual machine guns were getting hit as well. So that were getting damaged, they're not particularly well armoured. And the other thing that was happening was the 15mm armour on the Mantler was getting basically, um, where the gun barrels were, was getting hit. And what it was doing was squeezing the barrels, stopping the rounds of the actual machine guns firing. And 32% of the actual Panzer ones being used in Spain had this issue with the machine guns. And so, yeah, this is what basically was happening with the actual tanks themselves. And they basically... What happened was, in terms of, in terms of tactical um, use, it was less tactically relevant. Spain is more about the technical use of it. So technically, they learnt a lot. They realised that you couldn't have a machine gun equipped tank against gun equipped tanks. That was the real lesson. Basically, the gun equipped tank would always win. So they learn that and they take that out of it. Tactically, they didn't learn much at all. Neither the Soviets or the Germans learned much because both, basically they weren't using their own crews. They were using people who really just went in the tank and sprayed gun, um, machine gun bullets around. But this is what happened and they would have been basically fighting out there until 1939. They built 403 of the, um, the Pans 1 out of these and 1175 of the outtakes. The key thing was they knew that its life expectancy had run out and they were looking already at the Panzer II, Panzer III and Panzer IV. And that's really, you start seeing them obviously in France 1940, in Poland you'd have seen them in 39, 41 in, in basically um, North Africa, and you then start to see them being used as platforms for self-propelled artillery. So you get the Bison, that's the one with a 1.15cm uh, gun, uh, field gun fitted to it. You also get um, the Panzer Jaeger 1, that's the 4.7cm gun fitted to it. You get um, munition schleppers, so basically um, um, munition carriers coming on. You also get basically, they, they took one of the machine guns out in Spain as well and fitted a, a, an infantry um, flamethrower arm on it. And they basically also added um, a little um, additional uh, open turret to them and fitted Breeder 20mm machine guns to it. So it's a very capable um, tank in terms of adding and taking things off of it. And it was once it became obsolete as a gun tank, you used it as a munition carrier and basically a weapons carrier. 
and so they all have lives afterwards. And of course the other one you see is the Befallswagen. The client of Befallswagen that we actually find in the collection, that is the tank that has the command radio equipment in it that can receive and transmit. That tank would just have a receiver and basically would have been told what to do. The command tank allows you to tactically employ them and use them properly. Well everybody, I hope you enjoyed this uh, short talk and we're just about now to start the show and we're going to hold a, a turn over to David and uh, thank you very much. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please click on the like button below so that I know what people like and I know what to make more of. Uh, alternatively, if you've enjoyed it and think you'd like to see more, please click on the subscribe button. That way you get notified by YouTube whenever I bring out a new video. And you never know, there might be something in there that you hadn't considered because I do cover a variety of things on the channel. And finally, if you have a little bit of cash going, uh, I now have a Patreon account. Um, I'm always looking for patrons because at the end of the day, let's be perfectly honest, it's a good way for me to get a little bit of money that will use to buy review items or to travel to museums and so on. Uh, I don't put a huge amount on that. At the minute, all we've got is one tier charging a pound uh, a month, which just, as I say, helps cover my costs. See you soon.